Big Gab, episode 334 for Monday, January 24th, 2022. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here at GigGabPodcast.com. Uh, and here in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. I don't know that I have here anything the, else to say. <laughs> you said it all. Here in Napomo, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you doing today, Mr. Kent? You know, Dave, I'm good, but I suffer from an affliction. Okay, yeah, don't, don't we all? <laughs> I have this terrible musical ADD. You know, as I, as I work on material either stuff I think would be cool for the house rockers or my solo stuff or the, you know, various incarnations of small combo things that I do. I was looking through lists that I keep and I, and a, I have a bunch of lists because I have musical ADD, but B I am like between 50 and 80% good on about a hundred songs right now. And the number of those songs that I'll actually get over the finish line to a hundred percent is embarrassingly low. Because I'll hear something, I'll get an idea, I'll say, oh, I should dive deeper into that artist. Or, or, or oh, you know, country. I don't have any country in my, in my repertoire. I should have a couple country songs. And then I go deep in a rat hole and I have 20 country songs in various states of being started. And I am a great beginner and I am great to getting it to, pro, you know, proficient. I know the progressions, I know most of the lyrics, but getting it locked in and ready to perform, I am so undisciplined, it is... It is embarrassing. So, I, you know, I, I, I might know a little something about this uh, uh, just from personal experience. Um, and the, the interesting part is that for me, when I'm like doing work in general, and it could be stuff for like me personally or for, you know, one of the businesses or whatever, I find that if I'm getting super distracted, the thing that puts me on task is playing music in the background, you know, as, as and for whatever reason that, allows me to like dive deep and focus and takes, you know, a good chunk of that, that ADD away. Of course, that doesn't help when the thing that I need to work on is music because I can't play music in the background (laughs) when I'm supposed (laughs) to be working on music in the foreground. Right. So I don't have an answer for you. I know, but I, 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 I know what, uh, I know what you're saying. So I guess my question is at what point in the process does, playing it live happen because I I know for me, the reason I asked that question is for me, there is something valuable and, and instructive about playing a song with other musicians that gets me over, you know, one or more of those humps. Like, like I, I can sit down and, and learn a song and chart it all out and everything but the first time that I play it with other musicians, either in a rehearsal room or, uh, you know, it uh, or live and, you know, in front of a crowd, I come away from that knowing so much more about the song than I possibly could before having played it with other musicians. Well, no. So I would say <laughs> here's, a pro- here's a problem with that thinking is like. If you get the song good enough to, you know, see what you can do with other musicians and then you play with other musicians and you can get through the song, there's something endemic about the lazy Paul oh. Kent musician brain that says, oh, this is good enough. I don't have to go any further. I, I can get through this. I don't have to polish it for detail. And, uh, you know, check this one off. It's, it's, in, a, it's in a list somewhere. Yeah. And kind of, you know, when it's solo stuff, I can do a couple of songs in my show that I'm testing out that are good enough, but what what is it? Good enough is the enemy of great. Um, um, g- great perfect is the enemy. G- perfect of, is the enemy of good. Is really yeah. it's the opposite of what you're trying to uh, convince yourself. Yeah, yeah. So like I said, I have these long lists of songs that are in some state of almost ready. And to me, yeah. ready is like, you know what it's like when you have a song, and it is so locked into your being that. It just emotes out of you. It's a whole different musical experience. Oh, than, yeah. 
then you know kind of concentrate what's the part here what's the what's the roadmap here what is what is the lyrics i always get this wrong and, and you know and, and invariably when it's a part you always get wrong if you go to your brain oh, forget even it. if you you're done right oh, As, yeah. you know if you don't, have a choice don't think door just a and door, yeah yeah if you can go door a or door b and door a is wrong and door b is right you will choose door a 95 percent of the time in the heat of the moment for some reason i don't know what what guides us in that in that uh, thinking but yeah so Musical AD bums me out, you know. I, I and it's a question of discipline. It's like get over the hump, finish the song. Um, what it helps that is a, a lot of gigs actually, because if I have a lot of time to just practice stuff, practice ADD is different than show ADD. So totally. if I right, so so you can fart around, you know, and practice and get stuff, you know, in different degrees of of competence. But if you're playing a lot of gigs and you're putting stuff in. I think it, it helps to kind of like get stuff over the finish line. And, you know, you're going to play it in a live setting three times in a week is going to lock it in your brain more than. Well, so that, that's what month. I'm saying is it like I think it can and you're and, and I think you're saying it, too, that something can get to good enough. You bring it live and it can continue to improve from there because of of that experience and just the reps. Right. You, the more you play it, the better you're going to get. Sure. As long as you don't wind up in a like the the you know the 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 rut that you talked about, where it's like, oh, I get that verse wrong every time. Crap! I might do it for twenty years this way now. You know, so yeah, exactly. yeah. That it, but there, you're right though. There is this, there is this challenge of getting past good enough, and it's not easy because you're right. You you know as a especially as a performing musician that good enough can pass muster for, you know, 95, sometimes even a hundred percent of the people who came to see you play. And, and you and, know, it's not great. Well, that's it. Right. Good enough is, is mostly you knowing what you haven't done. You know, right. it makes you, makes you feel bad about yourself. Not that, not bad enough to change your habits. But, <laughs> I don't, I don't know. So like, uh, this would be so much better. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, I, I definitely suffer from this, right? I mean, I, I think it, we probably all do in our own ways. And where it, um, what I've started doing is I learned something from uh, my co-host at the Small Business Show a long time ago, and it, it's it's about managing discipline, which is a super difficult thing to for all of us to do. I heard it said years ago. I, this is going somewhere. To, bear, bear with me, but I heard it said years ago that uh, by by someone very smart. I don't know who it was. That we wake up with X amount of discipline points to spend every day, right? And you can't spend more than that amount. And once you've spent that amount, you're done for the, like with discipline points for the day. So you have to be very judicious about what it is you spend your discipline, energies, efforts, all of those things on. And so the trick is to create scenarios where the things that you want to do or need to get done Get done without you needing to just say, OK, I'm going to be disciplined and do the thing now that I must do that, you know, I don't want to do and I'm going to push through it and get it done. And so what I learned for me is was something from uh, Shannon Jean, who's the co-host with me at Small Business Show. And that was to decide the story that you want to tell and and then tell and then, you know, like tell yourself that story or even craft that story, even write it down, but somehow get it into your head. Because once you know the story that you want to be able to tell, then getting there doesn't require discipline. You are in fact driven to get there because you already know, I want to be able to say, I play, I, you know, for example, I, you know, I want to be able to say, I came on this, you know, I want to come on gig gab and be able to say this past weekend, I added 10 new songs to the set and they were all perfect. Okay, great. You know the story you want to tell. You know when you want to tell it. Now you're going to be driven to, like, I, I got to be able to tell that story. And so you're not spending those discipline points. So to me, that's how I hack my brain to to get stuff done. And I, honestly, I've found it lately has been working and paying off greatly for me. You know, I, I mentioned it sort of when discussing our uh you know, initial sessions for the third album that we're, we've been recording and now starting to mix and all that stuff for Bitter Pill, where I had a, a trip, you know, a week long trip right before we went into the studio. And I was like, no, I want to I want to be able to come out of the studio 
knowing that I played the best that I could play. And that meant taking drumsticks with me while I was away, you know, getting sticks into my hand every day, keeping myself like limber and, and also just doing like weird independence exercises to keep my brain in my hands evolving yeah. and, you know, new, new neural pathways and all of that stuff happening. So then when I got in the studio, I wasn't just trying to play catch up with myself. I was actually able to, you know, move forward and be creative and, and look, it, things weren't perfect in the studio because they never are, but I feel really good about how that, that worked. And I took the same thing in with me to my, uh, to my gig this weekend and made sure, you know, we, we had that bitter pill gig, which I'll talk about a little bit, but, um, but I, you know, I made sure I played my drums every day leading up to that gig. We had a couple of new songs on the set list that, uh, that we'd never played live or hadn't played live much. And so I made sure to play through those and not just rely on, ah, you know what? We did it in the studio a month and a month and a half ago or whatever. It's going to be fine. It, you know, the crowd will be forgiving. Like I, I didn't let myself hear any of that stuff. It was like, nope, yeah. I want, I'm, I'm, I want to be able to come on this show and tell that story. And, and so what did I have to do? I had to get drumsticks in my hand every day, play along with these songs, keep myself limber and you know, all of those things. And, and I will, you know, I will say it paid off. I have, I have some specifics to share about the gig, but, but, you know, I think, I think, I mean, you got to figure out how to hack your brain to get past good enough. And, and so well, it sounds to me and, and makes sense because I, I think everybody can relate to this. Yeah. If you are playing your instrument a lot every day, you are in a different headspace and a different physical space than, you know, the true weekend warrior that, you know, got a life and kids and, and a day job and, yeah. and, you know, maybe get some time at the end of the day, you know, to pick up his instrument. But if you are foolish time, not foolish, full-ish <laughs> time, and you are, you know, you are accountable for results with your instruments on a regular basis – you probably, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's not me. I have more time now, but I do know I still, like, I, I didn't play a lot of guitar this weekend. I watched football, right? Right. And even knowing I could be playing guitar while I'm watching football, you know, I took a couple of days off. You know, if you are truly in the groove where your job is playing your instrument and you are are playing guitar, bass, drums, keys, singing every day in a, in a regimented fashion, you probably are in a different a different headspace that that changes your physical space as well. I, I think that's probably true. Yeah, yeah, I, for sure. It makes no, sense. No, no. Any any yeah. pros out there? Do you have do you have ADD or are you like nope? If I if I procrastinate on this, I don't get paid, and so no ADD allowed for me. Or you know, do the pros out there still battle with good enough? Will get me through the session, get me through the gig, get me through you know whatever it is. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. It's a great, I, 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 I love it. I had no idea you were going to bring that topic up, which is part of the whole ADD of this show. And I love that we did it. And I, yeah, this gig this weekend, I think I said, you know, I know I said last week when we did this show that I wasn't sure this gig would happen. Right. You know, and, and sure enough in our private little, you know, chat that we have amongst the band, there was discussion about, you know, well, it's, you know, peak COVID right now. Should we be doing an indoor gig? And as soon as that came up, I thought, okay, like, Exactly what we talked about here. It, it's somebody's in the band is going to wind up not wanting to do the gig for, you know, because they're uncomfortable and, you know, all for one, one for all. And that was the comments that happened in, in the band group too, uh, which again, no great surprise, you know, cause it's, cause I, I, you know, that's how we are as a band. And, uh, but it turned out that everybody was like, actually, no, you know, I want to do the gig. I'm okay with it. I'm, I'm, I understand the risks. I'm, I'm good, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, you require, uh, Proof of vaccination? No, no, nobody, nobody. Well, it is not a mandate here in New Hampshire to have right. proof of vax. And so this is a, a public, it wasn't our private, you know, it wasn't a private a gig or whatever. It was just a, you know, a flight coffee and, and flight does not choose to, to require proof of vax. So, so no, right. no, it was just, you know, and, and no masks required either. There were some people there that wore them and most didn't is really how it is. Um, so you know, that that's just how it was. And yeah. yeah, the crowd was, that's one thing I love about bitter pill. You know, Billy and I were talking about it after the gig. It was like, yeah, the crowd was ran from, you know, people who were 20 to people who were 80, like literally. It, and that's the, one of the best things about this band is it really just the, appeals, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have, well, the, the knowing what I know about bitter pill and what you've shared with me, it, it, it is unique enough that it sounds fresh and new. Correct. With, 
musicians who clearly have a connection to, I mean, I don't know what's in your cover sets, you know, cause I only really listen to your, to your original stuff. I mean, it's almost like the cover stuff is, is, is it, it we do play some cover songs, but the, like, you know, the songs you, we play some cover songs that you, you wouldn't know, but then we'll play like, you know, nobody knows you, which is Cab Calloway and then Minnie the Moocher and, yeah. uh, you, you know, like summertime, sometimes we'll it play. It almost is like, like an that. interesting take on Americana music. You that's know, exactly what it is. Because the yeah. instrumentation that you have makes it so interesting. Yeah. that No, that's exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. Yeah. But it was great. I mean, and the place was packed. We actually, you know, made a good payday, which honestly, when we all got there, we were like, does anybody know how many tickets are sold? And, uh, and I was like, well, I, I know my wife and daughter each bought tickets and the people we were like, great. <laughs> so we got two sold, you know, uh, I, I so don't, it was an advanced ticket only type of, uh, thing. no, you could pay at the doors, 15 bucks a head. And, yeah. uh, and I, but then I eventually throughout the night, I wound up seeing the, uh, the, you know, the, the presale list or whatever that the, the person who was managing the door had. And it was like, oh no, okay. There's, you know, there were people on there. It was, I don't know, 50, it's like a cool room with there. all that brick and, you know, stuff. Is it really bright? You know, is it a, is it a decent sounding room? Cause it looked, you know, hard floors and brick walls. It, it seemed like it'd be. It's a, it's a risky room. You have to know what you're doing. Uh, you have to, well, you have to know what you're getting yourself into playing in that room because yeah, it's wood, wood floors, metal ceiling and brick walls. So yeah. you get all, you get the trifecta a of service. Yeah. And glass, of course. So, so it's, you get all four, but, um, I, you know, I got to use, it was the first gig where I used those new pasty symbols that I, I bought and the ride symbols specifically that I got this pasty signature ride, a 20 inch full ride, it, just so everybody, all drummers out there know the model. So it's the pasty signature full ride. I purchased it very and selected it very specifically for this type of gig where I need a symbol that can be general purpose for sure. Uh, have enough definition so that it doesn't get lost in its own wash, but not be overpowering and, you know, killing the person in the back of the room. Right. And so, and that's, that's a difficult thing to find uh you know it's it's the for me it's like the holy grail of of ride symbols and i'll say you know i mean i've had one gig with it so i'm i'm not you know putting all my eggs in that basket quite yet but i'm pretty much ready to that i've found the holy grail for me and it, it's you know it, it's it's the symbol of course that has to be matched with the way i play and also the type yeah. of sticks that i use the bead of the stick i use generally use sticks with a, a teardrop shape bead and and this symbol, it it responds perfectly uh, for me, and really worked out well for this gig. So I was I was stoked. Yeah, it's just it's a little bit. I don't even know how to describe it, but like it it has a it has more give than the the you know the the ride symbol that I generally use, which is this Zildjian Deep Ride, uh, an A Zildjian Deep Ride that I've had for you know twenty years or whatever. And it, it just has a little bit, it's a little bit more supple might be the, the just the when it, when I hit it, it, it absorbs the hit more obviously, but it's, but it's not just like hitting a, a pad of butter. Like it, it's still, I can, you know, I can still like make things happen with it and it's got enough, you know, it reacts and all that stuff. So I'm stoked about it. Like it, I'm, it worked out great. It sounded good. And then, it, you know, we had this interesting thing <laughs> for, um, which paved the way for the night. And it made it one of my favorite nights in a bar ever. Uh, as we were finishing our sound check, Billy was playing this little, he just kept playing over and over again, this thing just to check his bass. It was just three notes, dun, 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 you know, and he kept doing that over and over again. And it, it kept reminding me of the, uh, the, the riff, the, the sort of the foundation of the riff of Rush's La Via Strangiato. And I mentioned that I just said, Oh yeah, you can keep doing that. And mention it. And John, our guitar player, also a big Rush fan and everything. He started playing the guitar part for Lavia, And so he and I played, you know, most of the first movement of the tune uh, as we were sort of finishing sound check. And I was like, oh, that was fun. And then immediately the sound engineer puts Rush's subdivisions on the house music. And it was like, oh, okay. So we have another Rush fan in the audience. And he came up and he was like, I never pegged you guys as like a Rush tribute band. We're like, oh, no, no, we're not. And John made a comment. He's like, yeah, all we need oh, is a, be. <laughs> a, a singer and a case of beer. And we've got this covered, you know? Yeah. Um, but the best part was throughout the night, 50% of the music that he played, like b before we played in between sets was rush tunes. So 
I've never, I don't think ever in my life have I been able to hang out in a bar uh, and have Rush tunes playing because it's just not. Stars align for Yeah, it just, it's not a thing that really generally works. I'm not sure why it worked that night or if it worked that night, but it certainly worked for me. So it, it made it, it made it like one of these perfect nights and the crowd was great. The band played really well. Uh, certainly we had some clams. We hadn't played live in, you know, three months or whatever. And, uh, but everybody came in prepared and we had some really, really good moments. Lots of them. Nice. Uh, there was one moment at the end of it. We played this cover, uh, a Tom Waits cover, Get Behind the Mule. We play it, I'll say mostly straight, but certainly it just comes out, you know, it's, it's the six of us playing it. So it comes out like the six of us playing it. And for whatever reason at the end, I, before the gig, I realized I couldn't, I probably wouldn't be able to hear the guitar all that well because we didn't have the guitar mic. So it wouldn't have been in my ears. I didn't have a wedge, wouldn't have been in the wedge anyway. And so I ran a microphone. I just hung a, a sure SM57 off the right side of my drums and, and fed it into my little in-ear mixer that otherwise only had vocals in it from the board. And, uh, and I'm like, yeah, I just want to make sure I can hear John. And I'm so thankful. I, I don't even think anybody in the band, I don't know that I, I didn't say anything to anybody until just now. So probably nobody knew that I did this, but it made it so I could hear John. And at the end of Mule, I don't know, he, he started doing something where he had his wah pedal going, like sort of matching what I was doing on the hi-hat. And we got into this really weird polyrhythm thing. And, and just like the notes kept getting denser and more complex. And for whatever reason, we faded the whole song out that way. And it was just one of the coolest little moments. I'm sure inspired by our, you know, geeky rush obsession earlier in the evening. Uh, but it, it, it we, we just found a place and it was like, oh, that was, that was really cool. But that's like, but you know, I, I don't know that I would have been comfortable doing that had I not been playing my drums every day all week to tie the conversations all together. Like it, you know, I, my hands, I trusted that my hands would do what I asked my yeah. hands to do. You know what I mean? I get it. Yeah. Oh, those totally. sorts of things. So. Yeah, I get it. It 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 all kind of came full circle, which was good. I so, mean, it was it, wanted, it was a payoff. So yeah, yeah. You you get what you get out what you put in, right? You get what out a hundred percent, hundred percent. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So talking about your anything else about your gig, you want to share? I think that's well. No, I think that's it. Yeah. Well, it so a good I want to talk to you about. I want to do more because <laughs> yeah, have more of that, please. More of that, yes. please. Yeah. Um. So I have kind of an interesting thing going on. There's a venue that the House Rockers have played for many years. We played, they stopped music for a while, they brought music back, and they brought the house rockers back. And it, it, it you know, I would say over a 10 year story, we've, you know, played there almost monthly 80% of the time over the past 10 years, right? Sure. Changed hands again through COVID, new owners opened up, had a different format. New owners would like to go back to the old format and have talked to us about playing. But also talk to me about helping them. They don't know anything about the local music scene, and they um, really don't know what they don't know. And so, you know, they have asked some pretty good, earnest questions. But there's a, a few things that are interesting. Would you, as a musician, want to put yourself in between a venue and and uh, and the bands? Yes, it means getting bands that you know and like some work potentially. Although I need to talk about that. Sure. Um, you know, it also, those of your friends' bands who don't get recommended because they're not right could cause a little bit of friction that, you know, you didn't need to have otherwise. Is it a good place? You know, and I, I, I know there are other places that I play that there are musicians who do the booking. They book their own band in there yeah. and, and they, you know, they, they make a little side money by being the booking guy. It seems to me kind of fraught with with problems. And here's one of the things about the problems that I, I want to share. So again, he's, he owns his bar. He's tried a couple of, of formats for it. He's going to go back to a traditional format. The house rockers are willing to do it for the door. A hundred percent of the door. He loves this low risk on his part. He, you know, like kind of like I told the story about the last guy, he loved it too until he saw how much money we were making. And then he didn't love it quite as much, <laughs> even though he was loving his bar take. Right. But you know, this guy is like, well, yes, that's what I want. I want, I want other bands who will play for a hundred. That's that'll be my deal. So I said, here's the thing. I will refer, you know, 10, 15 bands to you. And I wrote an email for him to take a look at. And the email basically says, Hey, you know, a friendly band. 
Um, good news, this venue is going to go back to live music. Um, my band is going to do it. The deal is he will offer the door, but he'll offer 100% of the door. I'm willing to take that deal because I am I think I can bet on my band. We have a bit of a track record, and you know I, I feel comfortable with that. I think that's a good deal. Um, you have to decide if it's a good deal for you. Um, do you honestly have a draw that you think you can, you know, make money and, you know, make it for a, a positive relationship? So that's the essence of the, of the note yeah. that I'm, I've sent him that I would be happy to introduce him to other bands, but I would kind of cover myself and say to other bands, Hey, you know, here's the deal. I'm going to take it, but, um, it's up to you whether you think it's a good deal for you. Thoughts? <sighs> yeah. I mean, well, so I, yeah, lots of thoughts. The first thought I have is in response to your uh, your comment, like, would you get involved in this? Because it sounds like a risky thing. And I, I will zoom that out a little bit. I, I don't think I would get involved in it, but it's not so much because of uh, the the risk. It's more because of the well, not because of the risk of of the risk you identified it'd be more the risk to my time. Uh, I just don't have the time to, to, you know, go start booking bands, right. but, but it is like it, this is a time honored path. And in fact, like Paul Costley, who we had on the show, he's a booking agent and a drummer here in New Hampshire. Uh, far more of his income comes from his booking business than his drumming business. I would mm -hmm. assume, I don't know. I haven't seen his books, but you know, just based on how many bands and clubs he's booking for, I, you know, I, I know the, the math, he takes the uh, 10% off the top, I think. And so, uh, I think it, it, it's, it's a pretty typical path. The trick is, are you comfortable? The, the, are you comfortable being the one that has to play that role that for however many years you've been on, you know, the, the playing only side, are you yeah. comfortable, you know, in that role? And, you know, and so then getting into the details of, of this, so it's just an eyes wide open kind of thing, but the details of, of this where the club is looking for the band to fill the room and this, that, and the other thing like that sounds like a recipe for disaster. If the club is truly relying solely on the bands filling the room, that's a tough thing. It, you well, know, let me pause it's got to be it's gotta be detail, a, okay. It's, it's got to be a, color to be in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So also in this is the venue will support the marketing efforts by doing X, Y, and Z, and I've asked them to fill in what X, Y, and Z will be. So, so yes, if it's a hundred percent on the band, that's never going to work ever. This is right. not. Touring bands with followings and, you know, that type of yeah, thing. Yeah, right. So, but for, uh, but and, you know, but it's to his interest to figure this out, right? So he has this lease on this expensive property and he's got to find something productive to do with it. Like I said, I'm willing to take that deal because I've played there for 10 years. I know my crowd likes it there. Um, I know, I know I can, you know, do what I need to do financially in that place. Sure. I don't, I don't know how many other bands are able to say that. Um, and, you know, then it gets all into the weird slice and dices. You know, if it's a local cover band, bar band, and they're playing 10 times a month, right? Or eight times a month or four times a month, hard to get your people out. You know, we play in this area. We only play there once a month. And we only play there we, in the past, January through maybe May, usually April. Yeah. So it's a very limited time thing. And it works for a bar gig for us, right? The other bar gigs we have are about 40, 50 miles in different directions. And so we were able to put that mix in together. But yes, I have been very clear with this guy that um, that the financial proposition, you could be looked at as lowballing and it could create some, some yep. animosity. Yep. Um, you know, I don't want to assert myself in that. So I'm going to be very upfront with people and saying, I can take this deal. I am not recommending you do. I am simply saying, here's a, here's a possibility for you. Yep. Um, but yeah. And, but I do agree that if I was a band and got this note and I had an okay draw, the first question I would ask is, well, what are you going to do? Is it, is it all on me or are we doing this together? That would be the first question I asked. Yeah. And if he says, well, we got a website or, you know, I do, I have a Facebook page. I'd be like, yeah, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Okay. So, <laughs> You now know, tell me what you've again, really got. Yeah. 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 You know, are you going to take ads in the local papers? Are you going to, you know, what, what are you going to do? Yep. And uh, I think that that's the first question to ask. Um, but I do agree 
I wouldn't say the prognostication for this path is encouraging. Uh, there's, it's funny because there's a, a cover band central thread on this. Yeah. Uh, someone said that, someone said he just got asked to play a gig, and the and the first question from the venue was, "Do you have a following?" And lots and lots of replies that were mostly like, "If that's the, one of the first questions they ask, you could almost be sure that it's going to be difficult." You, you know, ranging from a perspective of, "I'm only there to entertain your clients," which I don't agree with that either. But um, um, well, it depends to, on the it depends on the venue. I, I mean, it, that, I wouldn't say that that's a universal uh, answer either, right? I, I mean, for a cover band, absolutely, it, it, there a, a huge part of it should be I'm there to entertain your clients. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I guess you're right. I, I got to be careful. Like, there are no absolutes. To no, anything there's no anymore, absolutes. Right? Yeah, right. Uh, but I would say in general, um. If a club has taken care of their business, so, so remember, this is a there's a mixed thing, and and yeah. here in the Bay Area, not a lot of clubs left, right? Live music, not a lot of venues, especially in the winter. In the summer, it's better. Sure. In the winter, not a lot. Of, so, so I guess we go back to say it's a supply and demand type of thing. Yes, there are some many venues in the world that um, have done their work and built their own local audience, and probably by guaranteeing them quality entertainment on a regular basis, right? Right, right. If the venue has built the audience, you know, the leverage is with them, right? If, if, but in this case, I would say there's not a lot of places to play. Um, a, a enterprising band, you know, a hundred percent of the door is a click in the favor of that's, that's not a bad deal, right? I don't know too many places. That, I, I don't know any other places that do that. Yeah. I, I right? mean, so well, that's yeah. that's an interest towards towards the venue be, having some fairness, right? Saying, yep. listen, you know, I'm going to put more of the heavy lifting on you. I will contribute to it by advertising or you know whatever it's going to be. But yes, um, you know, I'm going to do it. Could you make the argument he's basically saying music doesn't have value to him? I don't think that that's what it is. I think, I think, well, we'll see. We'll see when people respond to this. But I, yeah. I would say that, yeah, it's um. I don't know. I think I think for a cover band, I mean, look at all the gigs that the house rockers play, right? At least the I mean, I hear what you tell me about. And so I, I, it sounds like the lion's share of the gigs that you guys wind up doing, especially throughout the summer, are going and playing for built in crowds at, you know, the wineries and the, the you know, the uh, town park events or, you know, those sorts of things. And I think that's perfect. Right. They you know, you bring a quality product to to this you know to this this game and yeah. they provide a venue with a crowd that they want to entertain once a week or you know whatever it is and and it's a match made in heaven it's perfect right you you all do your part and everybody's happy at the end it's a you know non-zero sum game yeah and so i like to me that's what cover bands are all about is is that or or go play a wedding, right? Nobody expects you to bring your own crowd to a wedding. In fact, it gets kind of awkward when you do as a band, uh, you know, <laughs> so. You know, I, I'm going to I'll project this out as to where it goes. You know, like yeah. I can take that deal because I there's enough history and enough data to say. Sure. It's a good deal for me. He's not going to probably get many other to take the deal. Right. He's got to open his doors and pay his more, lease every, <laughs> every yeah. weekend. So he's got to figure out something. So, you know, in that in that movable target of leverage, you know. I think some bands will say, I'll do it, but I'll do it for this. And he's going to have to figure out what that means to him. Yeah. Because if he says no, and, you know, basically, you know, he's just going to open the doors with no draw, you know, no history, changing formats without any momentum, I think leverage will then go to the bands, you know, and they'll be able to get something. Oh, yeah. Yeah, for but, sure. Yeah. It, well, mean, you know, I think... I still believe that, that we will have the roaring 20s here. Uh, you know, the, the start has been delayed. Uh, yeah. But I, I don't think it's going to be delayed for that much longer. Uh, people yeah. are itching to go out. I mean, I, I would, like I said, I was shocked the other night how many people we had crammed into flight coffee. Like it, sure. was, it was like, whoa, this is the middle of winter. It's cold. Nobody wants to leave their house, but everybody wants to leave their house. Like, you know, we're done sitting around. And, uh, and, you know, and there were, there was a football game and a hockey game happening while we were playing yeah. Bruins were playing and, you know, and then there was playoff football and still, you know, and then there were tons of people that were like, Oh, I, I so wish I could have made it. I, you know, this, that, and the other thing. And so it's, um, 
It's it, I, you know, I think I think there will be it's possible that this deal might just work in spite of itself. Right. Because if if somebody says there's live music happening at this place on this day, people will be like, screw it. I'm leaving the house. Let's go. You know, and it yeah. might just work out through no fault of anyone. <laughs> you know, well, the other part of it that's likely to happen is bands being bands will take the gig. Right. Even even knowing that they're not going to be able to half fill the room. And if this and if, you know, from your lips to God's ears, if people if they're just going to fortuitously get people coming out because it's time to go out. Great. Yeah. But if it doesn't, then this guy, you know, is going to end up guaranteeing, you know, he's, he's going to end up opening his doors and not making his nut and, you know, still having a bigger problem than the venue. A good, and remember the premise of this is a good room. Like I've yeah. played there for years. It's a good room. I think if I played there with feeds, you once or sat in with you once there. Oh uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I selfishly, I want the room to work. Right. I've counseled the guy, you know, if you go door only, here's, here's the downside of that. You might not get enough takers. You might get takers, who take it because they want to, you know, play for their seven friends and they'll tell you that they can fill the room. But I'm telling you, not too many, not too many bands can really fill that. It's about two thirty, I think. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, not too many bands or you know, that I know, local cover bands can do that. And the ones that play often, you know, that, that's still a lot. So, you know, the A, the best is true partnership. You know, the band yes. is, has its act together to tell its fans and the venue is doing their part to create awareness and get people into the room. That's that to me is a success. I don't uh, in any case, it should be on both sides, yes. you know, because if everybody's a success, you, you know, that's good. Yeah. So, I don't, you know, even, even if a, there's not a lot of places around here where that have their own built in crowd, you know, every weekend, you know. So right. Right. anyway, it, it'll be an interesting story. So, you know, us, we're going to take the deal. Some bands will take it knowing that they're not going to be able to fulfill the, the implied proposition there. Uh, many bands will not take it. He's got a lease that he's got to pay every month. And so it'll be an interesting story. I will report back. Please do. Yeah, it, this ties in perfectly to a question that we got into feedback at GigGabPodcast.com from listener Jason, who says, uh, I'd love your thoughts on giving one-time discounts as a way of getting your foot in the door with a venue or organization that has potential for repeat booking. Uh, he says, my band was contacted by an organization that's affiliated with the local university. Uh, it, it's a private university business and has is a social club and they, they want to, you know, grow their thing. He says, it's definitely an upscale club that caters to university business folks, donors, etc., they have a series of tailgate parties before basketball games and inquired about hiring us for some of them. They balked at our normal fee, but told us they'd keep us in mind for their larger parties. On paper, this looks like it could be a very lucrative relationship as we'd be in the mix for football tailgate season, as well as the implication that they could afford our fee for their larger parties. There's also a potential for good exposure with a crowd of local wealthy business owners, but I've learned not to play strictly for exposure anymore. My band is fairly democratic when it comes to making changes to our usual business processes. And the vote uh, was to offer them an initial booking fee that is more in line with bar what bars and restaurants pay in the area. For us, this is about 60% off of our standard fee. Uh, this was a bigger discount than I was comfortable giving them, but I'm fully prepared to enforce it as a one-time exception. The reasoning, which I agree with, is that there's always been a band that nobody knows about until they hear us for the first time. We're basically weekend warriors with day jobs and families and can't gig frequently as, a, as full-time musicians. What are your thoughts on offering initial booking discounts? So this is, um, this is really interesting, living right near a university. I actually have experience with exactly this, and I think you need to take each scenario it, holistically, right? Like, the, the, just like we were saying with this other thing, there's no black and whites, right? It's not a binary thing. And I have found myself in pretty much this exact scenario. A lot of these departments at, at the university have strict limits on the cash that they can spend, despite being affiliated with, you know, what looks to be like this huge budget or whatever. But Jason's right. You know, these university relationships can be great gateways to being able not only to get involved with other university stuff, but also putting you in front of those fat cats, right? The donors and business owners that are also out there, you know, sponsoring or promoting the university or they're pro promoting themselves at university events. You get to, you know, we wound up doing a bunch of those private parties like with uh, with Monkey Fist and Fling for a while. 
And it worked out great because, you know, you're playing for all the, the movers and shakers of your local community. And um, but you don't want to be too cheap. Right. At the same time. And so the way I've done that is by opening up the door for trades. Uh, universities can potentially have things that might be of value to you that aren't just cash. And you can do a blended deal, you know, part trade, part cash, et cetera, et cetera. You know, for me, I like to go to uh, the hockey games here at UNH. They got a D1 hockey team. It's great. It's five minutes from my house. Uh, they couldn't give me season tickets, but they could give me game tickets here and there. What they could give me, and I had for a couple of years, was VIP parking passes, which makes a huge difference being able to park right next to the door when it's two degrees outside, you know, for these sure. games, right? Um, it Promotion in their flyers, like, you know, exposure. You don't want to get caught, like, like Jason says, you don't want to get caught in the trap of playing just for exposure. But there are scenarios where that exposure can be super valuable we wound up doing with again with Monkey Fist because of this gig. We wound up doing Dunkin' Donuts local, like they they have local, uh, the, like their their headquarters does this party every every year here in New Hampshire, and so we wound up playing that for I don't know five or six years. I think COVID was the reason we haven't played it in a couple of years, and it was you know it paid well and it was a cushy gig and all of that stuff, and the the whole reason that we got that gig was because the guy who, you know, who spends all the money was at one of these fundraiser, you know, donor thank you parties for UNH. And he loved that we played uh, uh, Just Like Heaven by The Cure. That was it. Like, he came up after that. He actually whistled the solos, which was fantastic because, you know, it made it fun and interesting. Uh, and the keyboard solos. And then, uh, and then, you know, made sure to get our name. And that was it. Like, th th we were locked in for the gig. And so the deal is, this is this is that same conversation about leverage. This, yeah. this listener has identified this is a good gig for us. This would this would be a good place for us. Yeah, they don't have to have you, and so you nope. know there's no obligation for them to have you. So what are you going to do? You know to get their attention. You either you're going to be a great salesman and say, listen, you got a bunch of bands. We're as good as any of these. You know, give me a try. You'll be happy. And yep. then they go, nope, nope, thank you. So what are you going to do? So price is one of the things you can negotiate on. I would say. In general, I mean, again, everybody's different. Every negotiation is different. Get something if you're going to give something, right? So your idea that there are mixed ideas and just, and you know, to propose, hey, well, you know, let's be creative about this. We can do it for a little bit less money, but, you know, can you include dinner? Can you include right. parking? You know, all these types of things. Don't, again, it, it's different. It might be a really up and up guy. Say, listen, I'll take a risk for you, but I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to put out the standard money I have because I don't have any idea, you know, what the night will be or what my crowd will yeah. will respond to you guys. So, so there's some risk here. So help me on that risk. And that I would say the first thing I would obviously do is say, okay, cool. If it works out, can we tentatively put in a couple other dates and you know assume we're going forward? If everything is always like you know, and again, you got to decide how much you want the gig. But if everything is always on their terms. You're probably not doing it right in terms of negotiating. Try and get something. Yeah, get something. And, and, and the trade and, the and trade deal please, can be great. Yeah. That's, that's really smart. Demonstrate that, you know, you understand your band has value, your your service has value, um, and that, you know, we will bring something really good to you. It's worth something. So, you know, let, let's find a way to make it better. And you still have to answer the question. Again, if you're just as good as anybody else he's having, why should he do right. this for you? Right. right. Yeah, of course. What have yeah. you done? Wait, you know, what, what's the thing? Desire, yeah. Does he desire to have fresh acts in there on a regular basis? Well, and you know, it's not. And you can satisfy that. Does he, you, do you play a different style of music? Do you want to recommend that he would benefit by having a different style of music? I mean, what is the pitch? Because if you're just another GB band and, you know, he has 10 good ones, really, why should he? Well, right? it, just, the thing, I, one thing I always try to remember and and want to and want to remind everyone is yeah like the, what you're talking about the product and certainly create differentiators where you can with your product either with quality or you know with the the way you perform your light show all of those things that, that we talk about endlessly here on the show but the other part of it is you right like you're negotiating with this person you're interfacing with this person you're building a relationship with this person and yeah, there might be a hundred other bands that are just like yours, but they don't have you and your relationship with that person. 
So yes, you want to continue to refine and improve your product so that you have that to sell. But also you being like you walking in there and saying, look, yeah, I get it. You don't have a lot of cash. I totally understand university red tape, man. I feel for you. Right. You know, providing some empathy, providing some of that understanding and then saying, but let's work together. I, like, what do you have? I got to be able to go back to the guys and show them that we're, you know, we're, we're all doing this together. And you being that reasonable, friendly, happy person that's easy to work with. There's value in that, too. Well, let me just say there, there's nuance in there, right? There's value that you come off as a as a a business person who has your act together and understands their value. Right. Don't, but don't overplay your hand. But don't, oh, of course. Don't <laughs> over, yes, yes. Well, you, you never want to overplay your hand. Right. But just being right. that that flexible, nice person that is, you know, easy to work with. And yet, you know, it still has boundaries because you don't just want people to run all over you. Uh, but it's an interesting discussion about yeah. what is that thing that makes a good re- – because you're right. At the end of the day, there are – you know, the overlap of cover band is pretty significant often. Yeah. So why does one get the gig over the other? And you're right. It often – It's things you don't see. Down, right. Well, it comes down to relationship. And so mm-hmm. what what is good at relationship? Like being pleasant, being um, – you know, and some guys might – you got to figure it out. Does a guy appreciate humor? Does a guy appreciate promptness? Does a guy appreciate – you know, you not calling him during his lunch rush. Does the guy, you know, yeah. you get it. You know, what, what are all the things that make for a good relationship and always be working for that? I mean, we say always be performing. I would say always be working your relationships as would be right after that is yeah. the best advice we could ever give. And it takes like, you have to be a good study of human nature. You got to be um, savvy about communication. You got to be um, thoughtful well, the, the trick, the trick is building trust, right? And, and that's somewhat different with each person in each scenario. And I right. will say this, one of the fastest ways I've found, and I, I'm choosing my words carefully here to build trust is when there's a problem and being able to solve that problem together and with an outcome that really works for everybody that yeah. is a fast track to trust. Now, I, I don't encourage you to create an artificial problem so that you can do that fast tracking because that, you know, <laughs> you've got to be a master at this in order to do that. Uh, but, you know, problems happen in, in business relationships. Last minute cancellations. You all know, the time. Can, can you step into that situation? Right. Um, you know, can you bring more people? That's, you know, that's add yep. to his business. That's another way to build trust and, you know, and appreciation. Yep. Yeah. I think that's all. I think that's almost a whole episode in itself because it would. It is. We yeah. kind of dig deep into the things you and I live in a day job life on a daily basis. You know. Yeah. And but it's particularly nuanced because I think in in band venue relationships, there's so often an overplaying of a hand. There's the, there's you haven't seen my brown eyed girl, right? Yeah. There's so much of that. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yep. Oh, it's true. I, I'll never forget, you know, I played uh, this club. I'm sure I'll play there again. The Boardwalk Club down uh, in Hampton Beach, right next door to the casino ballroom. And I'd gotten to know the owner for, you know, I'd known him for years. He and I would always talk business on set breaks and all this stuff. It wasn't until I came in there with Fling and we we played some Beatles tunes in our set because it's something that fling, you know, does well. We had all the harmonies down and he came up afterwards. He's like, I got to tell you, he's like, I don't give a hoot about what bands play in here. He's like, I never, I don't care about the music. It's a necessary evil. Now he'd never said any of these things to me before. Right. He'd always been cordial and everything. And obviously he kept booking different bands I was in and, and all of that stuff. And, uh, and he liked us, he, every band that I was in, he liked it because we understood that our job was to be playing when people exited from the, you know, the big show next door at the casino ballroom and draw him in for a couple of hours of, of drinks and, and fun and, you know, bar sales for him. And, uh, and he was always nice. Great. But he never said anything about the music until he said, I don't care. He's like, you are the only band that's ever come in here where I've actually liked the songs. He's like this is amazing. He's like, I never cared about the music before. And that was a huge compliment, but it was also really eye opening. Like, wow, you know, 
we like we talk on this show about exactly that. Like you haven't seen my brown eyed girl. The guy might hate brown eyed girl, but he understands that it's a necessary evil. So he doesn't care if yours is good or not. You know, he's going to book you in spite of all of that because you understand you, you understand the assignment, right? Like, and, and that's why we always got gigs there. And, and it was like, oh, this is interesting. I always, you know, I, like the bands I'd brought in there or I'd gone in with, I'd never booked any of the gigs there. It was always other people that booked them. But, but the bands I'd gone in there with, you know, were always good. And, and I thought, you know, played well and, and, you know, did a good job and everything, but he could have cared less. It was for him. He didn't care. It was like, oh, so that's a weird left-handed compliment. I'll take it. Sure. Sounds good. <laughs> But yeah, it's just about what's what is important to them and figure that out and and then be able to deliver it. And those are two different things. Uh, yep. And, you know, you're good to go. I wanted to give a shout out to listener Scott, who told us that uh, he used our Banzoogle code, which Banzoogle isn't an active sponsor. I think they'll come back. They take time off here and there. You've probably noticed if you've been paying attention to when we have them and when we don't. But uh, but listener Scott used Banzoogle for his his band called NorthCountyBand.com, and I'd like the the website was awesome. He he showed it to us, and I said, "Can I share this with the you know with the audience?" He's like, "Yeah, they they made it super easy. So it's not a spot for Banzoogle. It's not a spot for North County Band, but it's you know but we promote is. each other. But it <laughs> but it turns out that it is. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, if you've create you know if you have your website or whatever, whether you've created it with Banzoogle or somebody else, you know if it's if it's cool. I, I just love the way what they did on the site, how they kind of laid it out. It's simple. It's easy to get everything. You can see some of their videos. You can see, you know, their press kit and all that stuff. It's it's yeah. well done. Their dates. It's I'm just, back, Band Zogel. We love you guys. And, and it's been a good relationship for both. And, you know, we'll, we'll put up North County Band and, yeah. and demonstrate it. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good. That's good. Um, I, I know we're kind of at the end here. I want to, uh, well, I want to share two more things. Uh, one is Keep Your Eyes Peeled, Fling's EP is in progress of being released. Uh, we're, we're calling it The World Is In Our Hands, and it's all the tunes that we as Fling have been recording over the last, uh, I don't know, let's say year. Actually, one of them goes back even more than a year. Uh, but uh, but yeah, over the last, last year or so, we've been you know painstakingly working at these tunes and crafting them, and we recorded them all in our various different states of home studios and, and assembled them together and Russ mixed it and I mastered it and I'm stoked at how things came out. So uh, that should be, it has been in the queue with CD baby for uh, almost a week now, maybe not quite a week. So I'm hoping that within the next day or two, they will, they will see fit to approve it for release, which is I'm stoked about. So we'll talk more about that when it comes out, but um, keep an eye out for it. And we'll, we'll share it too. And speaking of fling, uh, Russ in fling sent a video in, uh, this YouTube video about a band that had all their gear stolen. And he asked, he said, you know, uh, maybe a good topic to talk about is how you insure your equipment. And so I, 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 I think I want to hear how you folks do it and then we'll, We'll we'll pull this all together in a in a future episode. Maybe next week we'll we'll talk about it. I I've I've figured out a way to ensure mine, but it's it's not easy. And so I'd love to have sort of thoughts and options from everybody yeah. out there before we before we start sharing it. This will this will be an ongoing conversation for Can sure. Can we tack on to this? Do you insure your band and do you insure, you know, like liabilities and things Whoa. like that? I mean Yeah. Right? I mean we sure. actually there was a there was an outdoor gig here a couple of years ago where one of my friends' bands his speaker tower fell over and fell on a lady and the, it's a, it was a civic concert. The band is getting sued. The town is getting sued. I mean, not, I'm sure a lot of people just heard that story and like the, the color drains out of their face at the thought that it could possibly happen. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, it's a thing. It's a thing. Part of having, yeah. Part of having your act together. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 I'd love to talk about that. Cause we've had some gigs where they have, you know, required us to carry our own, you know, umbrella liability policy or whatever it is. Yep. Uh, which gets which gets tricky if you don't already have a relationship set up to go in and have that well, for you. I so. have some good experiences that I'll be able to share. So let's Great. do it next time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But let us know how you're in, just insuring your personal equipment too, folks. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. And another conversation that our friend Daniel East started uh, with us is talking about, 
how you go about recording your gigs, what gear you're using, what microphones you're using and all that. So send in that stuff too to feedback yeah. at Gig Gab Podcast. We have lots of things to share for uh, future episodes. So yeah. Yeah. Oh. That's what I have for today. You got anything else, my friend? Nope. That's it. Wish me luck with this new venue. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't. Yeah. Old new venue. <laughs> right. It's, that's going to be, it's going to be interesting, man. I, I yeah. hope, I hope it works out for everybody, but it, it's, I mean, this is a tough business, right? It is. So. Bars are a tough business. Yeah. Right. Music is a tough business. Right. And that's why, again, if you can cut through the stuff and everybody has a win-win, it's probably that collaboration is a sweet spot. Although, you know, you would hear venues saying, I got to take care of myself and, you know, but I don't know. I yeah. mean, he, he clearly he doesn't because he wants live music, right? Right. Right. Yeah. So, so but it, yeah, you're right. That, expertise about live music. That whole idea of, you know, non-zero sum game. That's, that's kind of the, 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 the mentality I try to go into a lot of things with, including all of this. Like it just, it has to be a win for everybody at some level. Otherwise, it's not sustainable. Yeah. And that's the idea is you want it to be sustainable, but it takes right. work. It's, it's usually not just something that happens automatically. Um, yep. Even if you're lucky. Yep. Yep. All right. Oh, my brother, always be performing, always yeah. be ensuring. That's always. next week. But... <laughs> that's next week. <laughs> we <laughs> already have the performing. title. I love it. <laughs> hey, always be performing, Paul. Thanks, bro. Thanks, man. Take it easy, folks. See you next week. Thank you.